Good morning. I'm Melissa Harris Perry. Monday evening, 5:52 p.m. The unbelievable story that has dominated the news cycle this week began with this call to Cleveland 911. I've been kidnapped and I've been missing for 10 years, and I'm I'm here. I'm free now. It was 27-year-old Amanda Berry who disappeared the day before her 17th birthday in 2003, calling for help after emerging from a 10-year nightmare. Barry, along with her six-year-old daughter, 32-year-old Michelle Knight, and 23-year-old Gina De Jesus, was freed from the house of horrors where they were held captive, sometimes bound with ropes and chains for more than a decade. The survival story of these women after enduring abduction, enslavement, and torture is a chilling echo of others like J.C. Duggard and Elizabeth Smart that have also captured national attention. These are the stories we remember because they go to the very heart of our most horrifying SVU-fueled nightmares of teen girls and sexual vulnerability. But far more common when it comes to young women and sexual exploitation are the stories we forget or overlook altogether. Teen girls regularly denied the space and support to emerge safely into womanhood in an environment of sexual consent and exploration. Instead, America's young women are shamed, silenced, miseducated, exploited, and sometimes even denied health care. We got a good glimpse this week in North Carolina of exactly what that looks like in policy form. Republicans in the state's House of Representatives attempted to advance a bill that would have required minors to get notarized consent from a parent or guardian to be treated for sexually transmitted disease, pregnancy, substance abuse, or mental illness. It failed to advance after a debate on the North Carolina House floor, but backers of the bill were hoping it would, quote, reinforce the long-standing presumption that fit parents act in the best interests of their children. But the truth is that the bill only reinforces the misguided presumption that all children have fit parents. It completely ignores the reality that some young women seeking care for disease or for pregnancy are survivors of rape by the very parent or guardian who would have to give their okay. It overlooks the uncomfortable truth that younger women are more likely to have an older male as their first sexual partner which is associated with an increased risk of unwanted pregnancy, childbearing, and sexually transmitted diseases. And that when young people are forced to seek parental consent for birth control and STD services, pregnancies go up while the likelihood of teens seeking out STD testing goes down. At the federal level, President Obama's administration is pursuing the same kind of senseless policymaking in its opposition to lifting age restrictions on over-the-counter emergency contraceptives. If it were made openly available, emergency contraception would be one of the safest purchases a young woman could make at the drugstore. So devoid of any valid scientific evidence for opposing easy access to the drug, the administration's opposition boils down to this, feeling icky about the thought of young girls having sex. Listen, I get it. It is not a thought that a parent wants to entertain. But even less appealing is the idea of girls facing unintended pregnancies and finding themselves with limited reproductive options because the rest of us just can't handle the truth. As much as we'd like to bury our heads in the sand and keep them there, we cannot escape the facts. By the age of 19, 7 in 10 teens have had sexual intercourse. And if thinking about teen girls being vulnerable to sexual coercion makes you want to stop listening right now, you may want to take a deep breath for this. Some of those sexually active girls are having sex because they really like it. Now, you can stop clutching your pearls. The fact is that all teenagers who are having sex are not just acting out some kind of pathological behavior. Many girls are happily exploring their sexuality, educating themselves about their own personal boundaries in ways that are healthy, safe, consenting, pleasurable. Abandoning, the, abandoning the, the willful ignorance that informs many of our current policies requires embracing both ends of the spectrum. It means supporting girls who are sexually vulnerable and those who are sexually empowered, getting comfortable with our discomfort, and finally having some real talk about teenage sex, starting right now. Joining me at the table, activist, blogger, and feminist organizer, Shelby Knox. 
Dr. Melissa Gilliam from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology and the Center for Interdisciplinary Inquiry and Innovation in Sexual and Reproductive Health, both at the University of Chicago. Catherine Stimoulis, an education psychologist and adjunct professor at Hunter College, and L.Y. Marlowe, an author and founder of Saving Promise, an organization devoted to help women dealing with domestic violence. She herself was once a survivor. Oh, I want to start with you because I imagine this week and what we saw out of Cleveland was tough. Absolutely. This has got to serve as a wake-up call that tolerance will no longer be held when women are violated, mm -hmm. when girls are violated. And it begs the question, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Perhaps Amanda and Gina and Michelle's abduction could have been prevented if Ariel Castro had been held accountable for viciously beating his wife years ago. Mm -hmm. If the police had followed up on leads that they had gotten from the community. And if we, as the community, mm -hmm. had paid closer attention to the signs. We are so plugged in to our iPhones mm -hmm. and our iPads and our busy lives that we become unplugged to humanity. And, and, and why, it, you know, it, it does feel to me like there's like there's a special kind of evil that is that is Castro in this moment, right? What he did is is almost I inexplicable and unimaginable. Like I don't even want to spend time imagining it. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Shelby, I worry that, you know. Like my first reaction is, all right, I'm locking my daughter up. She's not going outside anymore because the world is full of too many dangers. And I worry that our response to the horror that we saw in Cleveland is to become even more horrified about the idea of the vulnerability of our daughters. So we just miss what they're actually vulnerable to. Right. And I also think that, you know, if the reaction is let's lock up our daughters and protect them, why is the reaction not let's make sure my son is not the next yes. Ariel Castro? Yes. Or let's make sure my son's friends know how to be how to intervene mm -hmm. uh, in, in cases of rape and, and sexual assault. I mean, these are the horror stories. As you said, this is the thing that we fear most for our daughters. Mm -hmm. But actually, what the biggest dangers are, are being uninformed mm -hmm. and starting to in explore their sexuality, but not having the information to talk about consent, to negotiate condoms use, not having the legal access to contraception, mm -hmm. not being able to talk to the adults in their lives, for instance, at school. You know, there are only 20 states in the United States that mandate sex education with HIV education. So we still have young people who are not getting this information, and that's where they're actually most vulnerable, vulnerable in the day to day. And, and Melissa, this is precisely the work that you do, right, at the University of Chicago, is that you're engaged with young people on the ground there, there at, in the city of Chicago on this question of vulnerability. What do you see from young girls in terms of how they're thinking about their sex lives? So I think we can look at it in two different ways. Part of it is what happens at a personal level and what they need to know. We're going to be very naive if we just think young people don't have questions or not wondering. Mm -hmm. What also happens is they really don't have safe spaces to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. And so we have to create these spaces for young people, but also understand the role of really helping them to thrive in every aspect of their lives. If you always frame it as risk mm -hmm. and all the bad things that will happen, right. we really lose this opportunity to build assets among young people. And those assets, communications, great schools, all of those things help to defer these risk behaviors. Now, so I want to ask in part, we've got, you know, the plan B image up because the other piece of like that, that was going around sort of behind all of this was this idea that we need to protect girls, not only from exploitation of some kind, but we need to protect them from their own decision making, keep them from walking in and, and, and buying plan B. You're a physician. Is there a good reason for us to limit the access of plan B to, to young teens? No, these are policies that really harm the most vulnerable young people. Mm -hmm. Plan B is incredibly safe. There are no contraindications to it. Accessing medical care is really, really difficult for young people. So the goal should be to lower as many barriers mm -hmm. for these young people to actually navigate, to have health care, insurance, all of those things. That's really hard for a young person. And in the middle of the night when they need this, that's not when you want to put these unnecessary barriers, barriers in place. Up. But what are the key barriers then that, that young women are facing as they're trying to have sort of reasonable and safe sexual lives as young people? I think a huge barrier is the shame and judgment that sexual young girls mm -hmm. face. And I mean, they get this message that female sexuality is wrong from all fronts. Mm -hmm. Parents, teachers, music, 
you know, media, all of that. So that shame can really inhibit a young girl from talking honestly to a doctor or to their parents, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the shame really silences young people. Yeah, I'm thinking if I have to go in to get Plan B and I live in a small town um, and it's behind the, the pharmacist counter and I live in a very small town and, and my pharmacist knows my yeah. whatever, my auntie, then, right, then there's ways in which because we don't act like it's going in to get antihistamine, right, we have a much a, a kind of shaming position on it. Right. And this is so much better than having to try to call up a doctor you don't know. I mean, it's frustrating for me as an adult to try to make an emergency doctor's appointment, sure. much less the transportation, mm -hmm. the finances, and just the wherewithal and maturity to do that. Yeah. So this is so much a better option. Yeah. When we come back, we're going to talk more about uh, about the issue of, of how we educate young women to be in this place, because Elizabeth Smart actually weighed in on abstinence-only education. Yes, that Elizabeth Smart.